Years ago, I did a series on Jesus in the Old Testament. And as I looked through the Old Testament, it was not hard at all to find pictures of Jesus throughout it. Pictures of his character, pictures of his activity, pictures of what he would do when he came to earth, pictures of his power and his attributes. And you can do that in any and every book of the Bible. How long are the list of attributes of our Savior? Well, in the book of Hebrews, in the introduction to Hebrews, in just the first few verses, we will find at least nine separate attributes listed in only two verses. In fact, someone pointed out to me that the title is a two-verse primer on Jesus, and that's four verses that we listed. Well, I can do math. Verse 1 is an introduction. Verse 4 is a conclusion. The primer is in the middle. So I want you to look with me because we're going to camp here today in Hebrews chapter 1 as we talk about Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, way down in chapter 12, the author talks about believers with feeble arms and weak knees. How did that happen? How does a Christian get to the point of such weakness that it has to be called out? Well, I'm convinced they were weak, and I'm convinced because of what I read throughout the whole book. They were weak in their faith because their theology was weak. You cannot have a strong faith in an anemic theology. It just simply won't work. If you don't understand a great deal about who God is, of who Jesus is, all that they are, your feet are not standing on solid ground. And that's really what the book of Hebrews is about. As you read through it chapter after chapter, you find them talking about Jesus in superior position over the angels, over Moses, his priesthood superior over the Levitical priesthood. On and on it goes. In fact, in two verses, in verses 2 and 3, there are nine points. I've been told that you're supposed to have three points and a, and a poem to have a good sermon. I have nine points this morning. But don't worry, I cut the poem out, so, so we'll be okay. And I promise not to spend more than ten minutes on, on each point, so I think we'll be out of here by supper time. You just don't worry. We have to be concerned about strengthening our faith because the journey is long. So let's let, let the Bible bolster our faith faith this morning. Let's read the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 1, where the author says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Nine things at least, that you can learn about Jesus in verses 2 and 3. The first thing we see is he says, in these last days, God has spoken to us. Jesus is the Word of God. No one said it better than the Apostle John. He began his letter with this very thought. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's not talking about the printed page. He's talking about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as being the Word of God. What does that mean? Jesus is what God has to say. Jesus expresses to us the mind of God, the person of God. Everything that you want to know about God, we say it's, it's confined to these pages. Beloved, it is confined in the person of Jesus Christ. As recorded in these pages... But Jesus had so much more to teach and say than we've been able to even grasp. But it begins here by understanding He is the very expression of the will, the mind, the person of God. And He says He has spoken to us by His Son. Attribute 2, Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe this is the most, um, the most often stated attribute of Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus preferred or liked the Son of Man name. But He's the Son of God. And that 
stroke, struck fear to a certain extent in the hearts of his hearers, if that was claimed. Because you see, in their mind, to say he was the Son of God was to say he was equal to God. He was on the same plane as God. He was not a lesser being, and my sons will tell you, a son is not a lesser being than their father. He was equal to the Father. He is the Son of God. And this passage of Scripture bears that out. Look down at verse 8 and 9 and see what it says. In verse 8, the first line there is, but about the Son, He says. The word He is talking about God the Father. And about the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You see that? God the Father calls God the Son, God. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Do you see how easily it moves from calling God the Father God to God the Son God? God doesn't have a problem with that. Some people on earth struggle with it, and I know why. Our minds are so limited... It's hard to grasp. It doesn't fit any other mold. We can't say it is like this because there is no other this to compare it to. So don't, don't beat yourself up or beat anybody else up if they don't grasp all that we learn or try to learn about the Trinity. But what Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us is don't think Jesus is inferior to anything or anyone anywhere at any time. He is superior he is superior to the angels, to Moses. On and on he goes. He is the Son of God. The third thing we learn, he calls him the heir. The Son whom he appointed heir of all things. Now that's pretty easy to read over. And even if you've been in the position of an heir where you inherited things, I inherited things from my father. You think that's, that's pretty important. Jesus is the heir of, let me say it, all things. That includes my inheritance check. <laughs> All things. Jesus inherits the earth, the sun, the stars, the universe beyond. He inherits every dimension. He inherits every life, every person, every moment, every dollar. It's all His. It's all His. It has already been given to him. And so every moment of my life belongs to him because the Bible tells me that. He's the heir. Everything that exists belongs to Jesus the Son. He is the possessor and the Lord of all things. When he was on the earth, he looked so poor. He seemed so poor. He only had the clothes on his back and those were given to him. He is the heir of all Things. He is the owner for two reasons, by right of creation and by right of redemption. And these, what we're about to learn, talks about that. But he owns it all for those two reasons, if for no other reason. Because the very next thing we learn, the fourth thing we see, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe, Jesus Christ is creator. He is the instrumentality of creation. Look down in verse 10 of this same chapter. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. You see that? He's talking about Jesus. John said the same thing in John 1. He said, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. It all came through the hands of Jesus Christ. He's not some Johnny-come-lately. He didn't just show up at the beginning of the first century in the womb of Mary. But He is the creator of it all. The creator of all... He's, because He's been here through eternity past and through it all. The instrument of creation. Creation like our faith begins with Jesus. As I thought about that, I thought about what Jesus accomplished... Out of chaos, He created everything. Out of nothingness, out of disorder, He created order and beauty and design. And I say that in the past tense, but beloved, He still does. 
There are probably people in this room just counting the numbers that are here. I'm sure there are a few people in this room that feel like their life right now is just chaos. There's no sense to it. It doesn't make sense. What has happened? What is happening? What seems like it's going to happen? You just can't put it all together. And beloved, what this book is trying to tell you this morning is the God that created it all out of chaos can bring beauty and order in your life when it seems chaotic, when it seems out of order, when it seems that nothing makes sense. Jesus still does this. If he can handle the creation of the universe, he can handle your problem. He can handle your life. That's what we're trying to learn this morning. The fifth thing we see begins in verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. Now, if you're listening instead of reading, S-O-N is not S-U-N in this passage. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. This writer is just grasping, reaching, trying to find words that adequately describe all that Jesus is because when he walked the earth, he looked like a Jewish carpenter. Did he really look like, in the flesh, the radiance of God's glory? And yet that's exactly what he is. As I thought about that, you know I realized something? Nobody in this room has ever seen the sun. S-U-N. You realize that? You've never seen the sun. So we talk about preacher. I go out there and look at it more in a few seconds. I'd go blind. I've seen the sun. No, you haven't. You've seen sun rays for a few seconds. You've seen the power of the sun light up your world but you've never seen the sun because the radiance coming from it is so bright, so glorious, you can't see through that to that ball of energy floating in the universe. Jesus is the radiance. He is trying to tell us how powerful Jesus is, how powerful the Father is, that we just get glimpses of His glory because that's all our feeble bodies can stand. Just like our feeble eyes can only stand a second or two at most of glancing toward that orb in the sky. He says Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus said this though. He said, No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. We can step away from the physical picture that I just painted. He is saying Jesus is the radiance of God, and yet He will reveal God to us, to those He chooses to. That He enables us to see the Father. Jesus said it to Thomas. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He has enabled that. Paul grasped at this as well in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 through 6. He said this, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake, for God who said, who just spoke these words, Let light shine out of darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. All those powerful words to say we've gotten a glimpse of His glory when we've seen Jesus, when we begin to understand who He is. He is the radiance of God's glory. The sixth point, aren't you excited? We're already at point six. The sixth point, He is the exact representation of of the Father. Look at it. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. The exact, or as we used to say down south, the spitting image of His Father. When you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. We already mentioned that. Jesus was trying to tell Thomas and, and the other disciples that. This is who the Father is. He wasn't talking about the shape of His nose, the height of His stature. He's saying, look at me. Look at who I am. This is the Father. This is how God relates to His children. This is how God loves people. This is how God disciplines. This is God. You haven't lost a step when you've seen Jesus in the flesh. He is exactly what God is. Did you realize that this word is a word in the Greek that you know? In fact, you can pronounce this Greek word. You can walk home today and say, I know Greek. Are you ready? This word for representation is character. I won't even make you say it back to prove you can. I believe. Character. 
Now, when you and I think about character, if I said Lee and I have basically the same character, you'd feel sorry for both of us. But you would say what you get from one, you get from the other, right? Well, this word used in the Greek was a little bit different. They used it to describe a coin that was stamped from a die or a stamp and said that coin reflects that die, that stamping mechanism, precisely. That's why when you pull a quarter out of your pocket, it looks like the next one, like the next one, like the next one. If it was printed the same time by the same mint, it looks exactly alike because it's printed from the same die. It is talking about Jesus being exactly like the Father. He has the imprint. He is cast from the same thing. They're the same. He is the exact representation of what God is. Whenever you struggle with God, when you struggle with what some people call mistakenly the Old Testament God, when your friends say, I don't want a God who does this or does that, if you want to help make life a little bit simpler for them, tell them, would you just read four short books for me before we talk about God. I want you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and introduce yourself afresh to Jesus. I know you think you know him. I want you to read what he says, what he does. Think about nothing else but what he says and what he does and come back and talk to me because then you'll know what God's like. You'll see the person, the character, the nature of God. He is the exact representation of what God is. What do we see next? He says, after the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He is the sustainer. Jesus created it all. But he's saying more than that, he sustains it all. I've often pictured Jesus as he goes to the cross that he's carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. I remember a Christian song from the 70s about, there, about that. He carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. Do you know he carries the weight of all things, the world, the universe, it all, all the time. It's all on him. He is the sustainer of all things. So the reason that the worlds don't go spinning off in infinity, that the stars have not uh, exploded and destroyed us, all of these things, Jesus sustains it all. How does he do that? By well, the power of the word. By his ability to speak. I've wondered, I'm not sure about this, but I've wondered when the Bible tells us that God cannot lie, I have to wonder if part of it is not expressed here. When God says something, it just is. He spoke the world into existence. He spoke light into his existence. Jesus sustains it all by the power of his word. If someone has that kind of power, you think you can trust his word? There are things Jesus said that people want to doubt. And I don't, I'm not saying people as in those people. I'm a people too. The things Jesus says, you, you've got to be kidding me. This loving your enemy thing, you realize how people will take advantage of you? You mean loan him something and don't expect it back? Do you realize I'm Scottish? I don't do things like that. The power of his word to sustain all things tells me his power can be trusted because there's nothing else in the world like that. That's the power of who Jesus is. He sustains all things. He not only defeated chaos and creation, He continues to hold it all together. Not only the universe, but you and me. He sustains all things by His powerful Word. Number eight, after He had provided purification for sins, have to stop in mid-sentence, He's the purifier. He provided it. It didn't say he purchased it. He provided it. He is our purification. His death on the cross, his shedding of blood purifies us. Jesus himself pur provided purification for sins. And let me stop and just say, argue if you wish. I believe this is his greatest work. Greater than spending all the worlds into existence greater than sustaining it by the power of His Word, His ability to redeem fallen man, His ability to take sinful man and put him in the presence of a holy God without man being destroyed. That's His, his greatest work. Nothing reaches that. I said early on, Jesus is the heir by virtue of His creation and by virtue of redemption. Jesus never did anything better, more powerful than the fact that he was able to redeem us. Anyone who marvels at the wonders of the earth and the wonders of the universe and fails to fall to their knees when they think about Jesus' work on the cross is blind 
and dull. This is his greatest work. We worship him for this reason. Not just because of his power. We, we are in awe of that. But what turns our hearts, the reason you're here this morning, is his love. That he gave his life for us and in that moment was able to redeem us, sanctify us, purify us. And he finally tells us after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. That's not trying to give you a location. It's not trying to say, okay, Jesus is now located here. Sitting at the right hand is indicative of power. It's indicative of being a co-regent. You know, I've always heard that phrase, he's my right-hand man, and I kind of thought that was just, oh, he's my best friend. No, that means whatever I can do, he can do. Jesus sits down at the right hand of the majesty of the Father. Jesus is co-reigning with God. Your throne, O God, he says again in verse 8, will last forever. Verse 13, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? God is telling God the Father, telling God the Son, it's all yours. You reign with me. And now you know nine things about Jesus or have been at least reminded about nine things of Jesus that you probably haven't thought of in a while. But how does it, why does it make any difference? How does this understanding, this theology, and that's what it is, this theology, how does it affect you today? You know, back in the, back in the 60s, when I, barely, I could barely read back then, you know, but back in the 60s there was a very, very popular bumper sticker came out, Jesus is the answer. And, and probably some of you even had it on your, on your bumpers, you know, Jesus is the answer. And it was pretty popular for a while until some smart aleck came up with a second bumper sticker that said, what's the question? And I guess we didn't know what to do with that or our bumpers weren't large enough. But actually, there are many questions and concerns to which Jesus is the answer because we've covered it this morning. When you have questions for God... You find answers in the Word, Jesus. When you want to get close to God the Father, get close to His Son, Jesus. When you wonder how it will all turn out, find the heir, Jesus. When you wonder how it all began, talk to the Creator, Jesus. When you're in the dark, be illuminated by the radiance of the glory of God, Jesus. When you can't see God, look at His perfect representation, Jesus. When you've lost your strength, Get help from the sustainer of all things, Jesus. When you sin, you go to the purifier, Jesus. When you wonder who's in charge, kneel before the ruler. It sits at the right hand of God, Jesus. Jesus is the answer. I want to give you two concluding thoughts and passages and we're done. These are found at the end of the book of John. John chapter 20 and 21. So look with me, if you will, to John 20. I want to read 27 through 31. You know the scene. Jesus has come and seen his disciples on that Sunday in the upper room. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas refuses to believe unless he sees. So the next Sunday evening, Jesus comes back for Thomas. And that's where we are. Verse 27. Jesus comes and you can see, you can imagine Thomas with his mouth wide open. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing... You may have life in his name. Did you hear that last phrase? By believing you may have life in his name. What we believe matters. What our theology is, what we understand of God, of Jesus, of the Spirit, it matters because life is found there. And if we want to have a strong faith, we cannot have an anemic, weak 
understanding of God. These things are vitally important. Life is found here. At the end of his book, the very last thing John wrote, and in fact, I can, as I read it, I think John must have laid down the pen and just said this, and somebody else picked it up and scribbled it. I say that because this is the only time John speaks in the first person, his entire book. He kind of avoids his own, he doesn't even put his own name in the book. He uses that, the disciple who Jesus loved. Last thing John says, just picture it, John lays down the pen, and he says this to you. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. That is not only true of what Jesus did, it is true of who Jesus is. I just spent a few minutes working over two verses in your Bible. What else do you think it has to say about Jesus? And do you think that you can contain all that Jesus is in a book this thin, and this is large print? No. The world would not contain the book. John said, I could tell you more and more of what he did. I could tell you more and more of who he is. It just, we can't contain it all. But beloved, I just leave you with this. Never, never, never be satisfied with what you know now of Jesus Christ. Always reach for more. There's life there.